No one knows what that is. All right. What page are we on? Uh, chapter 40, point one, or two, which is page 757 for 40.2. Seven fifty seven. That's what I said. <laughs> yeah. Let's just briefly go back over peptide hormones. Peptide hormones are active. Let's see what they do again. When a signal molecule such as epinephrine binds to a cell surface receptor protein, it activates a G protein on the inside of the cell. The G protein then stimulates adenyl cyclase to produce large amounts of cyclic AMP from ATP within the cell. The cyclic AMP then binds to and activates a target protein, such as alpha kinase, which adds phosphates to specific proteins in the cell. The effect of this phosphorylation depends on the identity of the cell and the proteins that are phosphorylated. That's a word you should know. Phosphorylation. A common way to get things done in a cell is to add a phosphate group to it or take a phosphate group away. And remember, that's how ATP gets made. ADP plus P yields what? Uh, energy. ATP. Oh, that's right. Adenosine diphosphate, you phosphorylate it, you add a P, you get ATP. There's different ways of phosphorylating it. We could do it by chemiosmosis, like in photosynthesis. When the phosphates get added, every time the electrons, every time the uh, hydrogen ions go through, um, that's called chemiosmotic phosphorylation. There's another way of doing it called substrate level phosphorylation. Mm -hmm. These sound familiar? Mm -hmm. You don't remember any of that? I do. So, uh, phosphorylation is adding a phosphorus. And so what, what they are saying that this molecule right here does, so these cyclic AMPs are made, and when one of them attaches to this protein, now that protein will go phosphorylate things, and then you get changes happening inside the cell. Different cells have different things that get phosphorylated, and there's, there's thousands of different enzymes like this, so we can't teach you all of those, but all the processes start out the same, you see. So the, the AP people are interested that you understand how it all starts. A signal is received, here's a signal, a signal received, there's a, the hormone comes in and it binds, and then you have this G protein, that binds to this adenyl cyclase. That produces cyclic AMP. Almost all the hormones work this way. And then the cyclic AMP starts to a, a secondary enzyme cascade inside the cell. So. Now, steroid hormones are different. There's a whole, there's two classes of hormones. There's your peptide hormones, that, and that's what most of the hormones are. And then your, there's your steroid hormones. And y'all look at me up here, and you go, he's so muscular, he must be on steroids. Here's how steroids work. Steroids can go right through the membrane. They don't have to bind to anything on the membrane because they're made of fat. They're formed from cholesterol. And they go right through the membrane because the membrane is fat also. And the membrane thinks it's one of its own, so it just lets it through. And, uh, and then this uh, steroid will eventually go into the nucleus of the cell. And it just does it by diffusion. It's just bouncing around, and one of them will eventually make its way in there. And will bind to a receptor protein that's in the nucleus of the cell. And that complex now has the right shape to serve as a transcription factor. 
Y'all remember transcription factors? Mm-hmm. Are proteins that bind to the DNA to start the transcription process? We learned about that in chapter 15. It's a long time ago. It was 13. 15 in the old one. And now transcription will get underway. You'll transcribe the DNA. You'll make mRNA. That mRNA will eventually leave the nucleus, go to a ribosome, and be translated into a protein. If this is a muscle cell, that protein will be actin or myosin. And so if I take steroids, my muscle cells start making more actin and myosin, my muscles are going to get bigger. Um, it does not. It's, it works in a different way. It reduces swelling. I'm not exactly I sure how. I have to take out. cortisone like every two months for my eczema, and I can only take it for like, a couple days because the side effects are so bad. Oh, really? I got a cortisone shot in my elbow not too long ago. Ooh. Trying to help me play golf. Mm-hmm. Somehow cortisone reduces swelling, and I, I guess it doesn't cause the muscular stuff, but, but I don't know. You'd have yeah. to Steroid hormones are not water soluble. They travel in the blood attached to protein carriers. When steroid hormones arrive at their target cells, they dissociate from their protein carriers and pass through the plasma membrane of the cell. Some steroid hormones bind to specific receptor proteins in the cytoplasm and then move as a hormone receptor complex into the nucleus. Other steroids travel directly into the nucleus before encountering their receptor proteins, not shown. The hormone receptor protein, activated by binding to the hormone, is now able to bind to specific regions of the DNA. These DNA regions are known as the hormone response elements. The binding of the hormone receptor complex has a direct effect on the level of transcription at that site. Messenger RNA, mRNA, is produced which then codes for the synthesis of specific proteins. Cool. So, steroids make it all the way into the nucleus, through the membrane, and peptide hormones bind to a receptor on the surface of the cell. Big difference. Yeah, I mean, normally your muscle wouldn't be transcribing and translating new proteins um, unless you've been working out or something like that. But those make it transcribe and translate new proteins without you having to work out or not nearly as much. Hmm. Why it makes muscle cells or proteins? It makes, see, see, proteins, do you remember actin and myosin when we were studying the muscle? So it makes those are proteins oh, in the muscle. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Why do pregnant ladies release more hormones? Um, we're going to study pregnancy coming up in the reproduction chapter. And there's all sorts of hormones involved in the menstrual cycle. And there are hormones involved in when you have a baby. There are hormones that turn on the breast milk and all that stuff. There are hormones that cause the baby to start to be born. There's a lot of hormones. We're going to talk about some We're going to talk about some of them today here, I think. Here is a uh, normal pathway to show how the pituitary gland functions to control the thyroid gland. Now, the, this is the thyroid gland. Do you all remember where the thyroid gland is from yesterday? In the brain. No, throat. Above the heart. But that's a thymus. Huh? It's in your neck, right? Back of the neck. There it is. There's the thyroid gland. It's in the neck region. Yeah, it's kind of wrapped around your... That's it, right there. Can't really feel it. Just make sure you eat enough salt. <laughs> Perfect. So your thyroid gland makes three hormones. Just three? Two of them, yeah, two of them are called T3 and T4. Those are, um, those are hormones that control your metabolism. 
They make the cells metabolize faster, work harder if those hormones are released. And your, your uh, hypothalamus, it's part of your brain, is what starts the whole process. The hypothalamus can sense how much of these hormones there are in the blood. And if there's not enough of them, this red arrow shows you that the hypothalamus will sense it. And then the hypothalamus will squirt out a special hormone called releasing hormone. And, and that hormone gets in the blood, and the blood goes to the pituitary gland. And the pituitary gland senses that releasing hormone. And the pituitary gland goes, oh, I need to squirt out some TSH, which is called thyroid stimulating hormone. And it does, and it squirts it into the blood. And then through the blood it goes, and the thyroid gland picks it up. And when the thyroid gland senses that hormone, the thyroid gland goes, oh, I need to squirt out more T3 or T4, or both of them. And it squirts out those hormones. And then the blood, le the level of the hormones in the blood will rise. And then the hypothalamus will sense that the levels are nice and high. And then the hypothalamus will cut off its releasing hormone because we don't need any more. So the hypothalamus is constantly keeping track, you see. And the pituitary does too. The presence of T3 and T4 in the blood will also inhibit the pituitary gland from releasing the hormone. So the presence of these in the blood inhibits the release both from the pituitary, pituitary and the hypothalamus. My old dog had a hypothyroid disease. Hypo means under, so not releasing enough hormones. Could that have been a problem with the hypothalamus? Because the hypothalamus causes... It didn't release the right if it didn't release its releasing hormone, then this wouldn't release its hormone, then this wouldn't have released its T3 and T4. So all, all three have to be working right to get the release. So would the pills you took cause it to release? It? Might cause the hypothalamus to release more releasing hormone, or it might cause the pituitary to release more stimulating hormone, or it might cause the thyroid to release more of its hormone. I don't know what was going on with your dog. Maybe the doctor figured that out. Or maybe there's a drug that'll cause all three of them to squirt out. Does it all go through the blood? It all goes through the blood. All hormones act through the blood. Y'all, this type of thing has a name. It's called feedback inhibition. Yeah, we heard about that. Where if the level of something is high, like if the level of T3 and T4 is high, it turns it off. So you're no longer releasing it. And if the level is low, it turns it on. So you start releasing it. We call this feedback inhibition. It's also called negative feedback. What else was that from? Uh, when we talked about body heat, body temperature, Wait, if it gets too hot, the feedback, the negative feedback will turn your body on so you start sweating and cool it down. Is that what, that what the substrates do? Yeah, yeah, feedback inhibition of the uh, in the enzymes. Yeah. What's uh, the um, You have a, a molecule that competes with the binding site mm -hmm. of of the original substrate. Maybe your product's kind of the same shape as the substrate and will compete with the binding site and not let the substrate in. That would be competitive feedback. So that's different than what this is. It's a little bit different. Yeah. Question for us. Yes, but it's so, still a feed, form, form of feedback. Yeah, so why, why is iodine important to this? Or do we get there? Oh, good question. Iodine is required to make these hormones. Mm -hmm. If you don't have enough iodine in your system, you'll get what's called a goiter. You ever heard of that? It's where your thyroid starts to grow and get real big. If you turn... To page 760, it shows a goiter. Oh. Let me go forward here a little bit. 
There's a goiter. And that's when your thyroid grows really big. And see, your thyroid, your, your body's thinking, hey, we're not making enough thyroid hormone. Let's grow a bigger thyroid gland, and maybe we can make enough thyroid hormone. When really the problem is you're not getting enough iodine in your diet. That's it. So all you need to do is mm -hmm. get some iodine in your diet, and that goiter will go back down eventually. What has iodine in it? Salt. You ever looked on a, on a thing that says iodized salt? Yeah, sea salt doesn't have it. In though. America, we put we put iodine in our salt so that we won't get goiters. And that and, and everybody gets enough salt. <laughs> we get too much salt, so we don't have a problem with goiters. Yeah, here. that's why it says on like sea salt, the salt is does not have iodine and no, necessary not nutrients. Iodine. Yeah. Wait, I remember um, like Ellie Gardner was going on to India and she was buying like a bunch of her stuff for a trip and she had to buy like. Well, to Th that's to kill, because iodine is also kind of poisonous to bacteria, so that's to kill the bacteria that are in the water. Okay. Yeah, but they would also help your, help, you know, help your uh, hormones. And normally, you just need a little bit of iodine. It's not much. So if you take a, uh, if you if you take a lot of iodine, you'll just pee out most of it. Yeah. We had to do that on How do you get on Oh yeah. So, here are the other hormones that the pituitary puts out. We already talked about the thyroid stimulating hormones. There's also adrenocorticotropic hormone. It's a hormone that activates your adrenal glands. You remember where your adrenal glands are? On your kidneys. It sits on top of your kidneys. The kidney hat for your adrenal glands. And then there's growth hormone. You all heard of growth hormone before, right? Mm -hmm. All the athletes abuse this hormone. You take growth hormone shots, your body will grow more, and you'll get bigger. And then there's one called prolactin. It's emitted by the pituitary, and it causes the uh, breasts to start making milk for the baby. And it's only released by women near the time that they're going to give birth. And by the way, all these hormones on the right here are released by the what we call the anterior pituitary. The pituitary comes in two halves. The front is called the anterior, and the back is called the posterior. So the anterior pituitary releases these hormones, and the posterior pituitary releases these hormones. So do they, are there just enzymes inside of that gland that just make all of the types? That's correct. They're in special special uh, enzymes, um, uh, well, the, the DNA has the right code, it goes through the ribosome, and the ribosome puts together the proper proteins to make the hormones. Are they stored in like certain parts of the gland? Um, stored in, in the actual cells of the gland themselves, in the endoplasmic reticulum, and, and the, the, that's where the hormones are, and they're, they're released through exocytosis, and they go through the blood. There's another one, a gonadotropic hormone, FSH and LH. Those uh, get your reproductive system working right, and I talk about that in about three or four days. And that's one of the ones you were asking about. Oxytocin is released by the posterior pituitary. That also caused the breast to make milk. And it also causes the uterus to contract. It's, this is the drug that they shoot you with if they want to induce labor. You ever heard of that? Oxytocin will make the uterus contract and push out the baby. <laughs> this is my pushing out baby. That's how I imagine it. I don't know if it's actually how it works. <laughs> and then there's another one, the posterior pituitary, ADH. It's called antidiuretic hormone. This is the hangover hormone. This hormone goes to your kidneys and tells your kidneys to conserve water so you don't pee out too much water. 
And it's constantly, it's, it's, it's levels are constantly raised and lowered to keep your water level in your body. Great. If you go out onto a desert island, there's no water around. The posterior pituitary will pump out a whole ton of this stuff. And you won't have to pee. You keep all your water in your body. You don't want to pee. So you don't pee a lot? So you, you won't pee a lot, and there's a lot of ADH. But here's the deal with a hangover. You go out and drink with your friends, alcohol stops the release of ADH. The alcohol kind of makes itself here not release any ADH. So you, so you don't conserve water. So you pee all the time. And you wake up the next morning and you had gone to the bathroom without realizing it about 15 times last night while you were drinking and you got no water left in your body. You're all dried up and it gives you a bad headache. That's a hangover. I thought a hangover was your body's like need for more alcohol. Mm -mm. Nope, well, it's, it's because you're all dried up. It needs water. Hmm. That's what your body needs. So if you drink a lot of water, then you won't get a hangover? Well, you'll still pee it out. Drink it, once and drink you're going to, well, that, it, it, help, it would help. But you'd still pee it out. You're just constantly peeing. You'd be just peeing even more. Yeah. You can't, you don't keep it in. So... One thing that'll keep water in your body is salt. Because water goes wherever the salt is. So one of the old tricks that people do is they put salt in their in their uh, beer and so they get a lot of, so they don't pee out as much and it it uh, kind of reduces the amount of hangover. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> That's an old trick. I never have done that because I don't do that. <laughs> um, anyway, here it talks about the pituitary gland. Hormonal communication generally begins with a part of the neuroendocrine system receiving sensory information and reacting by issuing a command to the body in the form of a hormone. In this example, dehydration is detected by osmoreceptors in the hypothalamus which then directs or stimulates the posterior pituitary gland to release antidiuretic hormone, ADH. The next step is to transport the hormone molecules to target cells. This is typically done via the bloodstream. Here, ADH is transported through the bloodstream to the kidneys and blood vessels. When hormone molecules reach target cells, they will bind to matching receptors on those cells and the hormone receptor complexes will trigger changes in the target cells. This causes the kidneys to reduce the urine volume output, thereby increasing water retention and countering dehydration. In blood vessels, vasoconstriction is increased, leading to higher blood pressure and thus countering the blood pressure drop caused by dehydration. So ADH causes your blood vessels to constrict too keeping the blood pressure up. When you're low on water, your blood pressure goes down, and that's not good for sure. Hey, there's Michael Jordan. Bugsy Bugs. There's a giant. You ever heard of giants? Uh-huh. Too much growth hormone. You want to see video footage of the tallest man I ever lived? Is that a midget or a kid? It's a kid. That's just a kid. Look at that lady, don't you look weird? Yeah, he's, he's, he's only I got the video. It's right here. What? That's not it. Back. It's a man from a small town on the banks of the Mississippi who first inspired doctors to investigate the causes of the condition which creates giants. In 1918, a child who would become famous throughout the world was born here in Alton, Illinois. Robert Wadlow was only six months old when this photograph was taken. By the age of five, Robert stood five feet four inches, already taller than his grandfather. At age 10, his growth showed no sign of letting up. 
Robert enjoyed a happy family life in Alton, going to high school and college like other young people of his age. But when the media discovered the Alton giant, he became a national celebrity. Introducing the famous Wadlow family. Yes, they own the only skyscraper in town. Now Mr. Wadlow will describe his property to it. And this is Robert. Robert is uh, seven feet ten inches tall. Oh, so he's 360 pounds. He's 15 years old. Everything had to be specially made for Robert. His shoes, his clothes, and especially his huge furniture. This is like deja vu all over again. I'm sitting in Robert's chair again after all these years. But this is it's absolutely amazing. You know, there are about five chairs, and no one can find any of them except this one here. Gene Crivello was a childhood friend of Robert's and recalls how popular he was. He was the kindest, generous person I ever knew. Robert had more friends than, than you can imagine. His neighbors, his YMCA buddies. He was the tallest Boy Scout in the world. He was the Everybody who met Robert remembers their first encounter. I knew him as a small child. I was a small child. He was the large person. <clears throat> I was in the sixth grade in Brighton, Illinois, a little village north of Alton. I, I was astonished at him, and I marveled at him, and, and I got to shake his hand, and he went up and up and up. I, I felt very tiny, and my hand just disappeared in his. Robert hoped to work in an office. He wanted to train as a lawyer, but the sheer size of his hands made this impossible. Now standing 8 feet 11 inches, he went on the road as a shoe salesman. His feet were larger than this shoe. This is a 37 and a half size shoe. And it's one like he would travel throughout the United States with his father and a member of the Brown Shoe Company to demonstrate himself and the shoes. And people would come into the shoe stores to see Robert and to buy shoes. He was a good representative for the salesman. He had a tumor of his pituitary gland. And the tumor just grew and grew. His pituitary gland got bigger and bigger and was squirting out all this growth hormone. Did he ever stop growing? And no, he died at age 22 from a foot infection. When you get so tall, you lose blood circulation because the blood can't make it back up. And his feet went numb. And he, he cut his foot and couldn't feel it. And he got an infection from that. Uh, um, what was the, you like what was the guy in Asia? Do you know him? The tallest guy in Asia, he has that too. He's got a tumor in his Yeah, they're trying to... Oh, really? 